Hi everyone, welcome to the talk for the paper called Ian, Multi-Behavior Navigation Planning for Robots in Real Crowded Environments. Now you might be wondering what the name Ian stands for. Let's find out. So looking at robotics research, we see a trend towards more general purpose robots. This means higher level tasks, more structured environments and shared robot human space. What does this mean for robot navigation? A uh, typical scenario is where we have a mobile robot with onboard sensors, onboard computing, actuated joints, maybe some map of the environment, and a high level task like get to the other side of the building. Now there might be people in the building, loose objects and so on. So the question is, which planner should I use? In this case, what you usually do is you choose an existing path planning algorithm to start from, you run some tests, tune it, and you have a somewhat good solution. There's a lot of good path planning algorithms to choose from, so typically you look at what they optimize for, the assumptions they make, and pick the one that matches your situation the best. So we do this for our problem, and at some point we arrive at a few observations. So the first observation is, when you're moving around and there's humans, you can find a lot of different situations. By different I mean, they can look very different, but they can also require very different kinds of solutions. And this leads us to observation two. If we look at how different planners perform in each of those situations, we don't see a single planner that does better than all the others. Rather, what we see is, this planner might be good in this situation, that planner in this one. And that makes sense, because planners typically have to make assumptions to make the planning even possible. For example, a typical assumption some planners make is that the world can be split into static versus dynamic obstacles, and that static obstacles will never move, whereas dynamic ones will move at some point. Because of how different some situations can be, it's hard to find assumptions which hold true for all situations. And when they break, the planners fail or perform poorly. So our second observation is that there doesn't seem to be planner supremacy. Finally, our third observation. If you look at what humans do in those different situations, a lot of the time, they're not just moving in two dimensions. They're interacting, saying things, showing things, maybe even touching one another to achieve their goals. In other words, sometimes to move past humans, we have to interact with them. And this is something that robots could also do, even without human-like bodies. So from these three observations, we make two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is that as navigation tasks get closer to the real world, the space of situations the robot can find itself in grows and diverges. It gets nonlinear and high dimensional. A better way to put it is different real world navigation situations require different solutions, different planning methods. The second hypothesis is that interactions are an important component of navigation among humans. So given these two hypotheses, we can formulate a new approach to solving our problem. And it goes like this. We define behaviors that contain interaction and are useful. We define a way to select behaviors based on situations. And then we run some experiments. So first, let's define those interaction behaviors. To keep things clear, Here's some definitions. From now on, when we say behavior, what we mean is a policy which maps from each state of the world to an action. But not just any kind of action. The actions outputted by a behavior are what we will refer to as interaction actions, which means they include joint actuation, speaker, and wheel outputs, not just two-dimensional movement. And in case you were wondering, this is what the name Ian stands for, interaction actions for navigation. In. So a behavior might be uh, play the flute and hop along a path, or make eye contact and approach. It can be pretty much anything you want, as long as you have a policy defined for it, which lets you control the robot. The amount of behaviors we could look at is large, but we're interested in a proof of concept. So we hand select three behaviors, which we call intend, say, and nudge. First. Intend is sort of the null behavior. It represents the behavior of moving to a target location 
as predictably as possible without explicit interaction. It's designed to work well when there are not so many humans, a few static obstacles, and people are mostly moving along, minding their own business. To implement the behavior, we use the reciprocal velocity obstacles algorithm, which avoids static and dynamic obstacles, and use a constant velocity model to predict people's target velocities. In previous works, we've observed robots being stuck because people in the way were simply not aware that the robot was trying to get through. A simple and familiar behavior is for the robot to audibly announce that it wants to get through and ask for some space. So the say behavior is designed to solve situations with unaware but cooperative people. On the other hand, it's not so rare to see people being uncooperative with the robot, for example, playfully blocking its way. In this case, a gentle but assertive behavior could allow the robot to get through safely. For the actual implementation of the nudge behavior, we use the dynamic window approach along with a speech and an arm motion when people are detected. Given a set of navigation behaviors, how does the robot pick which one to execute? So a trivial assumption is that in many cases, the space of possible paths between robot and goal is not singular. And as a consequence, a behavior aware high level planner must be able to search within the space for an optimal path. Also, for each path, the space of possible behavior sequences is large. How can we pick an optimal path and behavior sequence? There are several classes of approach which can deal with this problem. Let's look at three of them. Heuristic-based approaches are the simplest. They associate each state with the behavior. Optimization-based approaches start with some initial plan and then nudge it little by little until they find an optimal solution. Sampling-based approaches consist in throwing a lot of solutions at the wall and seeing what sticks. Because they're interactive, our behaviors affect the state of the world. And this is something that heuristic approaches don't represent well. What about optimization-based techniques? Well, if we model interactions as having multiple outcomes, then optimization is not a great choice because it doesn't give us a straightforward way to explicitly model the stochasticity. On the other hand, if we opt for a sampling-based approach, it's relatively easy to model interactivity and the stochastic outcomes explicitly. To do so, we formally model the environment as a partially observable Markov decision process. Given a state and robot action, this gives us a new state with some probability p and a reward. But how do we define the state and the transition model? To be useful, the state representation has to satisfy three requirements. It must be measurable, it must be as simple as possible, it must be as discriminating as possible, which means that it allows us to choose appropriately between behaviors. Like the behaviors, the chosen state representation is handpicked. First, it contains the robot position, and then it contains three features which encode information about the environment. Crowdedness, perceptivity, and permissivity. So crowdedness measures the person density per square meter, perceptivity the likelihood that people are aware of the robot's presence and intentions, and permissivity represents the likelihood that the environment is willing to let the robot through. Because we deal with uncertainty, our robot doesn't know the true state. Instead, it has a state belief which gets updated with sensor measurements. Defining a sensor model lets us assign a probability for sensor measurements given the state, and the state given sensor measurements. Now that we have a state estimate, what should the transition model be? In real life, the robot's action can impact the state of the world around it. Typically, this is represented as a conditional probability function, which can be integrated to obtain a posterior belief from a prior. The robot's action can also lead to multiple outcomes. Introducing discrete outcomes in our model each with their own probability and transition functions, let us sample these outcomes explicitly. For example, the discrete outcomes could be success and failure. These outcomes can be measured at runtime, allowing us to update the state belief. This means that the robot can plan for failure and react to it. Finally, we discretize space, which allows us to define transition and outcome functions locally and integrate them over paths. Given the state and transition models, 
we can apply Monte Carlo tree search to find the set of most promising behaviors and paths. Then we can greedily pick the option which guarantees the best distribution of final costs and success. But does it actually work? First, we test the nudge behavior in real, densely crowded situations. It's able to navigate despite a dense static crowd whereas other approaches fail. And this supports the hypothesis that interactions are important in navigation. To test the Ian multi-behavior planning approach, we design a simulation environment where interactions with people are approximated. Part of these approximation is based on our real-world observations from the nudge experiments. We use three maps from simpler to more realistic, and for each map we simulate six scenes designed to reproduce a variety of real-world situations. On top of testing the Ian planning approach, we test each behavior individually and also publicly available state-of-the-art path planning approaches. Though we were disappointed that Ian did not perform best in all metrics, it is the only method which performed well in both time-to-goal and success rate metrics for all scenes. And if we look at the per scene result, we see that efficient planners for sparse scenes fail in dense scenes, and planners which succeed in dense scenes are inefficient in sparse ones. This supports the hypothesis that no planner is best in all situations. When tested on a real robot, Ian performs reliably and successfully navigates among several interactive situations, both prompted and naturally occurring ones. Thanks to Ian's ability to update its state estimate online based on outcome detection, escalation arises naturally in the robot behavior. The robot first attempts to pass, then tries to ask for cooperation, and finally resorts to nudging, which succeeds. We hope you found this approach interesting, and we look forward to discussing it with you in person. So thanks for listening.